Hello and welcome to this edition of Wineskins. I'm Father Jim Corda. Wineskins is a program that features reflections on the lives of the saints and the sacred scriptures, along with a variety of issues and topics, all from a Catholic perspective. Wineskins is brought to you through the annual Bishop's Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts, a division of the Society of St. Paul. On our program today, we will have a special feature on Vatican II. We will also hear more information on St. Peter Canisius and today. As the Church celebrates a third Sunday of Advent, we will get a deeper insight into those particular Sunday readings. That and more on Wineskins. Catholic Charities is a very important part of the life of the Church and the entire human population. To share some pertinent topic with us is Nicole Beringer. Take a moment, sit and listen to real stories about real people living in poverty. Learn the facts about poverty in your community as well as the United States and understand the root causes of poverty. It's important to realize how people, just like you and me, are helping others out of poverty. Throughout our six county dioceses, an average of 16.4% of the people living as our neighbors and friends are living in poverty. More than 40 million Americans live in poverty and an average of 2.5 million children experience homelessness in a year. All those people who earn less than the federal government's official poverty threshold, which for a family of four is about 24,000 per year, are considered to be living in poverty. People working at minimum wage, even holding down several jobs, are unable to make ends meet. Seniors living on fixed incomes and wage earners suddenly out of work are a few more examples. There are millions of families everywhere from our cities to rural communities living in poverty. Poverty does not discriminate. It affects young and old, men and women, and people of all ethnicities. Let me share with you a short story. Amy recently suffered job loss due to her company downsizing and moving out of her rural community. Amy is a single mother with a seven-month-old son. She was looking for work and trying to make ends meet. She had depleted her limited savings while trying to find work and was now faced with an eviction notice. Amy reached out to Catholic Charities for help. Catholic Charities was able to help avoid her pending eviction by assisting with past due rent. They also worked with Amy on a new budget with a game plan for getting on top of other bills. Amy received funds from Catholic Charities' Keep the Kids Warm campaign for utility assistance. She also received emergency material assistance with diapers and formula until she was back on her feet again. A few weeks later, Amy called to inform Catholic Charities that she did find another job in management at a local retail shop. She knew the road ahead was still going to be challenging, However, she was so grateful to Catholic Charities for helping her through a very tough time. Amy is just one of the 7% of employed people who live in poverty and among 16% of women that live in poverty. Every day, Catholic Charities is working to counter the effects of poverty by strengthening families, creating jobs, and improving neighborhoods. What can you do to help Amy and others like her? You can pray for all of those living in poverty and near the poverty threshold. You can also learn about poverty and causes of poverty in your community. Many resources are designed to help individuals and groups not only begin to understand the size and scope of the problem, but also start thinking about the ways in which they can take action to help create awareness about poverty in their communities. Finally, you can offer your support to Catholic Charities agencies throughout the diocese as we work daily to help break the cycle of poverty. One way to help Catholic Charities is to support the Keep the Kids Warm collection in parishes across the Diocese of Youngstown. Using funds from Keep the Kids Warm, Catholic Charities is able to help children and families when needs arise. This collection runs throughout the month of January, which is National Poverty Awareness Month. Every day, Catholic Charities assists clients who face the challenges of simply affording life's basic necessities. Your support for Keep the Kids Warm allows Catholic Charities agencies to serve all qualifying individuals, regardless of their faith. Community and parish participation in Keep the Kids Warm is appreciated because the responsibility for eliminating human suffering and fighting poverty belongs to all of us. If you would like to make a contribution to Keep the Kids Warm or would like additional information, visit Catholic Charities' website at www. 
www.ccdoi.org or call Catholic Charities at 330-744-8451. If you miss the Parish Collection, you can send your donation directly to us at 144 West Wood Street, Youngstown, Ohio, 44503. Please make your check payable to Catholic Charities. Despite the challenges poverty presents locally, Catholic Charities will be there to provide help, create hope, and work with others to develop strategies that provide a hand up to those bearing poverty's burden. It takes all of us together to make a difference. In the words of Mother Teresa, not all of us can do great things, but we can do small things with great love. For Wineskins, I am Nicole Berenger. St. Peter Canisius was a priest and doctor of the church. To tell us more is Pat Kelly. He is from St. Charles Church in Boardman and the chief financial officer for the Diocese of Youngstown. This Jesuit saint died in Switzerland in 1597, was canonized and declared a doctor of the church in 1925, and was inscribed in the Roman calendar in 1926. Pope Leo XIII called him the second apostle of Germany after St. Boniface. Born in Holland, Peter was educated at Cologne and at the Louvain. At the age of 23, he entered the Society of Jesus and published treaties on the Fathers of the Church. Ordained to the priesthood in 1546, he became the theologian to the Cardinal of Augsburg at the Council of Trent. Called to Rome by St. Ignatius Loyola, he was sent to Messina, Sicily to teach rhetoric. He made the solemn religious profession at Rome in 1549. St. Peter Canisius then returned to Germany and spent the next 30 years there working for the renewal of the Catholic life. He had several important posts and eventually became Jesuit provincial that included Germany, Austria, and Bohemia. He also founded numerous Jesuit colleges that became decisive factors in the Catholic reform. He died peacefully in 1597. The significantly modified opening prayer of the Mass presents St. Peter Canisius as a defender of the faith. Versed as he was in the theology of the Fathers of the Church and the sacred scriptures, he was a most suitable person to defend and expound the teaching of the Church. The Office of Readings describes a mystical experience that St. Peter had in Rome before leaving for Germany. It was as if you opened to me the heart in your most sacred body. I seemed to see it directly before my eyes. You told me to drink from this fountain, inviting me, that is, to draw the waters of my salvation from your wellsprings, my Savior. I was most eager that streams of faith, hope, and love should flow into me from that source. I was thirsting for poverty, chastity, obedience. I asked to be made wholly clean by you, to be clothed by you, to be made resplendent by you. As to the relevance of St. Peter Canisius, we first note the apparition of the Sacred Heart because that devotion became widespread in the 17th century and was later called an obligatory devotion by Pope Pius XII. Secondly, given the contemporary interest in the ecumenical movement, St. Peter Canisius is an excellent example of how to dialogue with persons outside the Roman Catholic Church. The opening prayer says, Lord, you gave St. Peter Canisius wisdom and courage to defend the Catholic faith. By the help of his prayers, may all who seek the truth rejoice in finding you and may all who believe in you be loyal in professing their faith. For Wineskins, I'm Pat Kelly. Welcome to our segment called Year of Faith, celebrating the 16 documents of the Second Vatican Council. I'm Father Jim Corda. And I'm Father Jeffrey Mickler of the Society of St. Paul. And the document we're going to discuss today is the Decree on the Media of Social Communication. This decree was passed first and perhaps implemented last because it took time for the bishops to really get their minds around the importance of social communications. They'd been steeped in the traditional teaching from the pulpit, teaching from Catholic schools, that sort of approach of proclaiming the gospel. 
But this inspired little document set the church on a new course that has been so vitally important. Let's talk about technology back then when this document was promulgated, and let's talk about it now. How has it changed over these 50 years, and what was technology then, and what is it now? Technology has always impacted the faith. In the ancient church, there were very few copies of the scripture. They were all handwritten. In the medieval church, they began to catechize people through the use of stained glass windows because they couldn't read or write, but they could see the story of salvation there. And in the artist's brush, they would get to know the sacred scriptures in paintings and murals, etc. When Gutenberg came along, it changed everything because by then everybody was learning how to read. The Bible was more accessible. It prepared, in many ways, the Protestant Reformation. And then this explosion of knowledge that came through printing changed the way we lived our faith. And in the mid-20th century, it was apparent that there was a new explosion of technology that was just beginning, but has affected every aspect of human life, including the way we share our faith with others in the world. They call it social communication, and in its pure sense of the word, it is social communication. But there's also this sense of it's not as personal as talking as we are today. What's the difference, and in, in what do we need to be aware of when we talk about communication in the church? Well, there's always going to be that one-on-one -on -one interpersonal relationships that build up the faith and strengthen us all in the sacraments and in the way we share what we believe. But then there is this broader way where a piece of technology is between us and others that nevertheless connects us with perhaps dozens, perhaps thousands of people, and we get connected with thousands of other people through this new technology. I have over so-called 500 friends on Facebook. I hardly know any of them, but we're all sharing random thoughts, and our lives are intertwined with one another because of it. And the capacity to spread truth or to spread error has been greatly increased, so we have to use these means and use them well for the truth of the gospel. Let's talk about the good and the bad of social communication. We know that it could be used for great benefit. It could also be used for great harm. What's the middle ground in all of this? Well, from the 20th century, we learn many lessons. The Nazis were the first to really master propaganda and change the heart, mind, and souls of a whole nation towards evil, mainly through the use of radio and the press. This is a, a warning for all of us. Right now, in general, there's five major corporations, maybe six major corporations that control 95% of the news. Is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? We have to be educated consumers of what we receive so that we can distinguish what is right and what is wrong, what makes sense to us and what does not make sense. And that old adage, avoid the near occasion of sin. You know there's going to be certain elements that are filled with hatred, filled with falsehood, which we're better off just staying away from. I've always been uh, fascinated by Marshall McLuhan's uh, statement, the medium is the message. Mm -hmm. What exactly was he saying when he made that statement? Well, when two people are talking, the message is the words between them. But now the people that are listening over the radio to this program are listening through the medium of radio waves. And those radio waves inevitably will affect how the message is received to those unknown and unseeable listeners. And they themselves will be able to sort things out by either changing the radio station or staying tuned for more information on this point of the dial so that the medium itself is really uh, a part of the message. You know, oftentimes um, kids nowadays are so not only interested in social communication and those means, but know it and do it so well. What do their parents need to learn and understand in order to not rein them in, but to ensure 
that they're doing it and using it in an effective, healthy way. Well, there are different generations of parents. Parents in their 20s are already steeped in social communications. In their 30s are already steeped in it. And in their 40s have a pretty good understanding of it. By the time you reach the 50-age generation, there's a lot of people just groping to figure out what it's all about. But the main thing is, in all things, to keep children focused on areas that will build them up, not tear them down, and help them become actually more social and more civil rather than vicious and uncivilized, which we see in so much of the bullying and other problems that come up with children on the Internet. Do you think that we become obsessed sometimes with the media? That I'm just thinking of Hollywood, for example, or whenever something breaks, you know, we're always tuning into our television or listening to the radio or going to our Facebook or Twitter. Why are we so obsessed with all this? And is there a way for us to kind of rein that in and to be more conscious of that? Well, I don't know if we could rein it in. We should try to ride it like a surfer on a wave and enjoy the ride, but knowing, like every surfer knows, that at any moment one false move could have us drowning in perhaps dangerous and unfounded information. But in a spiritual journey, there's such a thing as seeking silence and asceticism. And each of us, if we could just have a minute or two a day where we really try to be silent with the Lord in the presence of God, that will help us enormously. And that's why traditional devotions like the rosary slow us down, help us out, and get us refocused. What about those peoples and those countries, and there probably are, that, that have no concept of the social media? What is our role in order to bring them into that, if that's appropriate? Well, in some ways, they're better off, but in most ways, Uh, This hurts them because they're exploited by the larger world culture in so many ways. So the church has to be a defender of the poor, looking out for their interest when no one else will, and gradually through our educational institutions in these countries, help people determine their own destiny by having the knowledge and skills they need. Father Jeff, give us just one final thought on this particular decree. Well, It changed the way the church is proclaiming the gospel, and we have to thank God for it because we are reaching the ends of the earth as Christ himself commanded us. For Wineskins, I'm Father Jim Corda. And I'm Father Jeffrey Mickler of the Society of St. Paul. For more pertinent information and to listen to Wineskins, visit www.doy.org, the website of the Catholic Diocese of Youngstown. Stay with us. We'll be back in a moment. This afternoon, I've got a very important meeting. I was up half the night thinking about it, going over exactly what I want to say. I don't think I've ever felt this nervous. Because this meeting is with my brother, Tom, and we haven't spoken to each other in 11 years. Why let another day go by? If you think you can't make it right, you're wrong. A message from the Catholic Church. 33 million Americans have descended into poverty. And as their futures fall, so does our nations. Our song today is from the CD called Our Savior is Born. It is by the students from Kellenberg Memorial High School.
As we celebrate this third Sunday in Advent, we will hear more about the sacred scriptures by Father David Rhodes. He is Pastor Emeritus of St. Christine Church in Youngstown. One of the characters of the Advent Christmas story who looms larger than life is the person of St. John the Baptist. One cannot reflect on the meaning of Advent without including him. He always appears on the scene on the second Sunday of Advent, which was last week. We met him out in the desert where he was preparing large crowds for the coming of Jesus. His message was a call to repentance, which means total change of mind and heart, a conversion of one's attitudes and behavior. But John shows little patience with the insincere Pharisees who step forward for his baptism. He calls them a brood of vipers. His message is harsh. He refers to winnowing fan and fires and an axe, which refer to a coming judgment when the truly converted will be separated from the unconverted. Today, on this third Sunday of Advent, we meet John the Baptist again. Only now he is in prison, in jail, because he has told Herod that it is wrong for him to marry his brother's wife. The Gospel has two parts. The first speaks about John's faith crisis. It seems that John's followers have been telling John about Jesus' ministry, his healings, and his befriending sinners. John is confused because Jesus is not turning out to be the type of Messiah that he is announcing. John, it seems, is looking for one who is more forceful and stern. Where are the axe, the winnowing fan, and fire spoken about last Sunday? Has John been disillusioned? John wonders if Jesus is the one who is to come, or should he look for another? Jesus' response is disconcerting. Contrary to popular expectations, Jesus will not be a military leader who will drive out the hated Romans, nor will he be the hellfire and brimstone Messiah John's preaching tended to imply. Rather, Jesus is to fulfill the vision of the Messiah described by Isaiah in today's first reading. He will bring healing to the sick and mercy to sinners. In fact, Jesus offers evidence to John's disciples that he is indeed fulfilling the prophecies of the prophets concerning the Messiah when he tells them, the blind regain their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised, and the poor have the good news proclaimed to them. In short, Jesus goes to the very heart of the messianic prophecies to assure John and his disciples that Jesus is indeed the promised Messiah. St. John the Baptist in today's Gospel represents the many persons who at some time in their lives also question who Jesus is. Is he really the one who is to bring healing and salvation to my life, or should I have looked elsewhere? Or one may question at a certain point in life the vision and goal to which one gave his or her life, only to discover that whatever was expected is not emerging. John the Baptist represents all of us who experience a crisis of faith in whatever form it takes. Jesus says in today's Gospel, Blessed are the ones who take no offense at me. In the second part of the Gospel, Jesus goes on to define John's role in history and to assure him and his followers of his calling. He is not a reed swaying in the wind like his unprincipled jailer Herod. In fact, John's role is greater than any of the great prophets. There has never been any greater than John the Baptist. Yet, as Jesus says, the least in the new kingdom that Jesus is inaugurating are greater than John, because they will experience the great outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which will happen after John's death at Jesus' resurrection. What a tribute to all of us, people of faith, who despite our questioning and struggle, are assured that to be a part of God's kingdom is to be greater even than the great John the Baptist. For Wineskins, I'm Father David Rhodes. Advent is more than a time of waiting. It is more than a time of preparing for the Lord. 
it is time to accept the truly awesome blessing offered to us in today's gospel. O come, let us adore him, truly adore him. Let us prepare his way in this world. Wineskins is a production of CTNY, the Catholic Telecommunications Network of Youngstown. It is brought to you by the Annual Bishop's Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts. I'm your host, Father Jim Corda, wishing you a beautiful week. have you done for your marriage today? I gave my wife a hug this morning. I thought uh, I love her. I uh, did her hair this morning. I think it looks pretty good. <laughs> I cooked my husband's uh, favorite breakfast. I bought her an orchid. <laughs> what have I done for my marriage today? I sent my husband a love email. I read the newspaper to my wife and it cracked her up. She's, but she's still laughing. <laughs> what have you done for your marriage today? Make a change for the better. Need help? Go to foryourmarriage.org. A message from the Catholic Church. They say America is the land of opportunity, but for some, life isn't so easy. Right now in America, one in six children lives below the poverty line. That's nearly 13 million children of all races all across our country. Where do you draw the line and get involved? You can make a difference in more ways than you think. Go to povertyusa.org today, because one in six children in poverty is one too many. A message from the Catholic Campaign for Human Development.